Let your say amen. I made one mistake when I was talking about the men's fellowship. That is October the 27th. Amen. So I'm sorry I said the 28th, but it's Thursday, October the 27th. We need all uh, men uh, to be at the church. We'll talk about how we are supposed to be protectors and not predators. Amen. That's the amen. The subject. Praise God. I need all the men there. We got to be protectors and not predators. Praise God. So make sure you are there. All the men, young men and older men, are uh, there on October the 27th for our men fellowship. Let's go back to the word of the Lord. Uh, in Revelation chapter 2, in verse, uh, at right around verse, uh, let's take a look, verse 9. It says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. But he says, be faithful even to the point of death. I want to minister from the subject this morning, stay faithful. I need you to tap one person next to you and just say one person. Tell that one person, stay faithful. Stay faithful. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love. We ask in this moment that you would show us favor again with a word. Speak Holy Spirit to us in this moment and in this time so that we might hear from you. Lord, we right now, we ask that you give us an anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Speak Holy Spirit so that when all is said and done, we can say that we heard from you. Lord, give us hearts and minds and ears to hear and receive your word in in Jesus' name, and all the people of God said, amen. Amen. Stay faithful. Uh, this is the second sermon in our series called Being a Better Church. Amen. We're trying to be a better church. Amen. Not because we are a bad church, because even a good church can get better. Amen. Even a solid church can be strong. Even an active church can be more sharper in their focus of activities. We're trying to be a better church. Amen. I don't know about you. I'm trying to be a better pastor. I, I hope you're trying to be a better deacon. I hope you're trying to be a better trustee, a better choir member, a better a better member. I, I, I hope all of us are trying to get better. Amen. It's no good if you got in the faith and you're not trying to grow and you're not trying to get better. And don't think that just because you've been in church, amen, 20 or 30 years, amen, you still don't have room to grow, amen. We all have room to go. So we're trying to be a better church, amen. I can't speak for the church down the street, amen, but Second Baptist, we're engaged in trying to be a better church. And so two weeks ago, I mean, because I wasn't here on last week, amen, I thank you for allowing me to have a week off, and uh, we came back here this week, but on the few weeks ago, we spoke on the church of Ephesus, and we discovered that the Lord said they left their first love. Amen. And Jesus said, return to your first love. He was calling them to return to doing the things that they did at first because you do know you can get into a ritual of church life. Now, you can get the ritual down so well that you forget the one you're supposed to be in love with. Amen. You can look and sound churchy but not really be in love with Jesus. Uh, so always remember, falling in love with Jesus and being a disciple of Christ is the main thing. Hallelujah. Seeking God and serving God daily is the main thing. We can't, we can be running around and forget to sit at the Lord's feet. Hallelujah. So being a better church means we've got to be a church that's in love with Christ. That was the last sermon. And so this week, I want to share with you from the subject, stay faithful. Being faithful means being committed, devoted, and dedicated to something. It means to be loyal, constant, true, unswerving, unwavering, and steadfast. When you're, you're faithful, you don't quit. Amen. When, when you're faithful, you hang in there. When you're faithful, you stick around even when things get rough. It's one thing to start off faithful. It's another thing to stay faithful. It's one thing to begin faithful. It's another thing to end 
being faithful. It's easy to be faithful when things are easy. The true test of faithfulness is when things get difficult. Now, I've got to add a caveat to this. Some things are meant for you, aren't meant for you, excuse me, in every season of your life. I've got to throw a caveat on there. What do you mean, Pastor? There are some things that were meant for you, and they're, but they're only meant for a season. They were just supposed, so you were just supposed to be faithful in that season, and when that season was up, you are okay to move on. I, I was supposed to be at, I, I was supposed to be at St. Paul's Baptist Church for the seven years I was there. When I left to come here, I wasn't being unfaithful to St. Paul's. Uh, my season had ended over there, and a new season was starting over here. I'm still in good relationships with them. It, it was just the time for me to be faithful over there ended, and it was time for me to be faithful to God over here. What do you mean, Pastor? I may have changed locations, but I'm still supposed to be faithful to God. Uh, uh, th there might be some changes in our lives, but none of those changes should stop us or hindering us from being faithful to the God that saved us, the God that delivered us, the God that made us brand new. Our loyalties may not always be with some things or some people, but our faithfulness to God can never change. We must remain faithful to God no matter what changes we may go through, no matter what heartaches we experience, uh, no matter what disappointments we may have. We are called to stay faithful, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, Second Baptist, we, we, need to want, we, we should want to be a church that is faithful to God no matter what. Uh, we want people to, we want, we want to be a people that remains committed to God no matter what we face in this life. Everybody say, stay faithful. In a world where folks can't stay faithful to many things, let us be a people that stay faithful to God. Uh, I, I was thinking just the other, I was doing at the funeral yesterday, and I was, uh, I really don't like doing all the funerals that I have to do, but because I do so many funerals of folks who were extremely faithful, it is a constant reminder of what faithfulness looks like, and it challenges me to be faithful. Just yesterday at Brother Jefferson's funeral, and earlier in the week at Mother uh, 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 Hewlett's funeral, and then Mrs. Tucker's on the funeral before, uh, they were just people that were faithful. Everywhere they went, they were faithful. They, amen. They were just models, and they examples of faithfulness. And so when I do these funerals of these faithful folk, I, 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 I look out and, and I see the benefits of being faithful in your marriage. I, I see the benefits of being faithful to a dying and sick spouse. I see the benefits of being faithful and staying faithful to your family. I, I see what it looks like when you're faithful and you never give up on your children. I, I see folks that work hard and provide for their family. I see what faithfulness looks like when I keep doing these funerals. And it is a reminder to me, amen, I got to stay faithful. I mean, yesterday, Brother Jefferson been faithful for many years. Mother Tucker was faithful for many years. Miss Hewlett was faithful for many years. Over and over again, I keep on seeing these folks, when they got an opportunity to serve, were faithful everywhere they went. When they read Mr. Jefferson's uh, uh, obituary yesterday, when he was in Charlottesville, he was faithful. When he was in Boston, he was faithful. And when he got to Richmond, he joined the church, even though he was sick, to his attempt to be faithful. I, I don't know about you, but when all is said and done with my life, I want folk to say he was faithful. Ah, and so my role today is to encourage you to be faithful to God. Uh, in today's scripture, in today's lesson, we're studying a church who was experiencing great persecution. Although the church that was in Smyrna was a wealthy town, excuse me, the, the, the city was wealthy, and they, the city had plenty of resources, the church was struggling because they were committed to Christ. Uh, their faith had put them in a position where some folks in the city hated them and did everything possible to make their lives miserable and unbearable. These believers were under intense pressure to give up their faith. Uh, they were suffering because they loved Jesus. They were suffering because they wanted to walk in the light. They were suffering because they gave up uh, stealing and gambling and drinking and smoking and, and doing things. They gave up uh, their sin to live for Christ. Uh, and because of that, they're facing persecution. These believers were being persecuted to renounce Christ uh, or to give up their ability to thrive in the community. They were facing tough choices. Uh, some were even threatened to get beat up and be put in jail. The 
the city was rich, but the church was suffering. The city had all sorts of resources, but the church was poor. They, they, didn't, they didn't have opportunities because if you were a believer, they, they weren't going to give you a job. If you were a believer, they weren't going to let you buy and sell in the city. Even though the city was known for its wealth and resources, if you were part of that church, amen, they cut you off. Uh, they disenfranchised you. They didn't want to let you have anything. Uh, they were suffering because they loved Christ. Uh, the city was a great city. If you read up and study of this particular city, the city was known for their production of myrrh. The city's name, Smyrna, was derived from the name of that resin that came out of that tree. A myrrh was a material that was used in everything from medicines, perfumes, and embalming. A myrrh was worth more than gold at that time. It, was, it had so many uses. Uh, the name myrrh it really means bitter. Uh, myrrh was bitter to the taste, but it smelled sweet when it, some heat was applied to it. I'm trying to help you here. Amen. It didn't taste all that good, but it smelled so good when burned that it was used to cover the smell of a dead person. Myrrh can make a dead person smell sweet. Myrrh can make the smell of death tolerable. Myrrh didn't cure, cure, cure death or stop death, but it made it more tolerable. And beloved, God is speaking to someone today and letting you know that he may not take you out of the suffering that you're going through, but he's going to help you tolerate the suffering that you're in. Oh, oh, I'm trying to help you right now. Amen. God doesn't always take you out, but he gives you something to help you while you're in it. Oh, that's shouting material right there because he ain't always going to take away the cancer. He ain't always going to take away the sickness. He ain't always going to take it, but God will give you, amen, something in your life that will help you walk through the fire and walk through the flood. He'll give you strength in the midnight hour, amen, to help you hold on when there's nothing left. Uh, and also, mere, myrrh, excuse me, was retrieved from the trees, and the way, only way you could get it was by cutting the bark and crushing the leaves. When the leaves were crushed, the myrrh could be extracted. The myrrh was valuable, but in order to get the valuable thing out of it, something had to be crushed. Oh, oh, you're not hearing what I'm saying here. Jesus is addressing a people who are feeling the pressure, the crushing of living for Jesus. Jesus is reminding this church that the bitter things in life will, all, will turn out sweet in the end. Oh, y'all missed that. Amen. He's letting them know, I know you're in a myrrh situation, but myrrh gets sweet under pressure. Uh, that's not the sermon, but I'm just giving you some background on myrrh. Uh, I do believe there's someone under, in the sound of my voice. You may be experiencing a bitter taste in your life right now. You're dealing with some bitter situations. You're living with some bitter people. You are working with some bitter folks. Uh, life is bitter. Your friends are bitter. Yeah, amen. The co-workers are bitter. The dog is bitter. But I'm here to let you know, even if you're in a bitter situation right now, because God is about to turn your bitter thing sweet, or oh, y'all didn't shout like you should have shouted. I know, I know, I know, I know it's bitter, but when you, when you apply heat and pressure, to the bitter, the bitter can turn sweet. Ah, so don't you quit. God just heating up the situation. That's not the sermon. That's just background. Smyrna was a great city, but, but the believers were dealing with a tremendous amount of persecution. The city had myrrh. They had wealth. They had commerce, but the church was struggling. But there's a word for this church, and I believe that Jesus gives this word for this church to speak to us. Uh, most of us, amen, amen, are never going to have to deal with the kind of persecution that this church had to face. Most of us will never have to deal with the kind of pressure that these folks were under. Uh, so if these folks were encouraged, amen, to be faithful to God under these heavy circumstances, uh, surely we can be faithful. Uh, you didn't hear what I said. I said, if they can be faithful and we'll never go through most of what they had to go through, surely you you and I can be faithful, amen, because nobody is threatening your life if you come to Second Baptist and sing in the choir. Nobody is threatening to take away your job if you usher on third Sunday. Nobody is threatening to put you in jail if you help out on the media team every first, second Sunday. No one is threatening to beat you up if you serve in the children's ministry, making sure they got cookies and cake. Uh, uh, we don't have any of those kind of persecution they had, and, uh, we can, and uh, but we, uh, well, we come up with all sorts of reasons not to come to church, all 
all sorts of reasons not to serve, all sorts of reasons to go back in sin and go back to our old life, when the reality is if he can tell these folks to be encouraged, to stay faithful, surely you and I who are going through our light afflictions can be faithful to the most high God. Ah, uh, I remember one time, I mean, I, was, I remember one time, and I'm just going to be real, I was young and I was dumb. I remember one time I got mad at my home pastor in Maryland. Amen. Not my pastor in Richmond, but my pastor in Maryland. And I got mad, and let me, let me break it down. This is the pastor, and this later on, this is the pastor that made sure I had $300 every month in my account, amen, from the three years I was in seminary, or the three and a half years I was in seminary. And let me give you kind of reference. My rent was only $400, and he made sure I got $300. Amen. Every month. This was that man. Amen. The man that made sure I got scholarship after scholarship. This was this man. Well, a few years before, I had the audacity, amen, to get upset with him over something that I can't even remember what it was. I left the building. I got in my car. Holy Ghost arrested me in the parking lot and said, you better go back in there and serve the Lord. Too many of the youth are counting on you. Too many of the kids are expecting you. So I dragged my contrary, easily offended, back up in there because the Lord said you better stay faithful. I don't know what my pastor said. If now I look at it, it probably wasn't all that much because I look back on it. The man loved me like a son, took care of me like a son, and I had a good daddy. I didn't need another daddy, but I had two good daddies in my life, and I had the audacity to think I was and get mad at him. I got, Beloved, you got to stay faithful. Look at the text. At the beginning of every letter uh, to, to these seven churches, uh, there's a greeting. I haven't got to the text yet. There's a greeting where the Lord uses a title or a way to describe himself that is specific to the church situation. Take a look here. He said, now, when we taught the Ephesus in the previous verses, Jesus said, I'm the one that walks amongst the seven lampstands. And what he was saying was, I see everything. I'm in the middle of everything. I know everything. That's good news. Amen. God's in the middle of your situation. Amen. He knows everything. He knows what you need to fix. Amen. He knows what you need to change. He knows what you're going through. Amen. He knows what you need, but he knows everything. Now, now when we get to here in verse 8 of the Church of Smyrna, he says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came back to life. Here's the first point. Staying faithful, watch this, is based on knowing who Jesus is. Write that down. I know it's simple. I know it's easy. Amen. But you got to remember who he is. Because uh, when you're in the, in the sick room, you got to remember he's a healer. When you're in the courtroom, you got to remember he's a lawyer. When you're going through, the, you're getting you're at the 25th and you ain't got enough money to make it to the 30th, you need to remember that he's a provider. I'm going to tell you right now, just knowing who Jesus is. And the thing is, he's flexible. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. What do you mean he's flexible, Pastor? He can be what you need him to be when you need him to be. It. Hallelujah. And, and so, but here, the, he says, I am the first and the last, the one who died and came back to life. So, staying faithful, hallelujah, is based on knowing who Jesus is. Jesus addresses this church with words of encouragement. He first tells them that he's the first and the last. Well, he wants the church to know and he wants us to know that he has the first say and the last say on what happens. Um, here in Revelation, this title refers to Jesus' eternal existence. He's the one who created and consummates history. He's timeless. He's the first chapter. He's the last chapter. Amen. He knows when time ends and he knows when time begins. Uh, he knows when your suffering is going to start and he knows when your suffering is going to expire. It ends with him. Uh, the reality would inc have encouraged this church to bear up under suffering because he knows their future. Hallelujah. Jesus was letting them know that your situation may start off bad. But with God, God can turn your bittersweet. He's the first chapter. He'll be the last chapter. Just because you have some chapters in the middle with pain and suffering, beloved, this is what you need to understand. It's going to start with Jesus. And it's going to end with Jesus. You might have to deal with the devil in the meantime. You might have to deal with some bitter folk. But it's going to start with Jesus. Oh, my God, my God. So, so, there are, so, so here you have concluded that, that, that you got to understand, he, he tells the church, I'm the first and the last. I'm going to have the last say on all of this. Then he goes on to say that he's the one who died and came back to life. 
Well, he encourages the people that he is the one, not only is he the one that rewrites final chapters, he said the devil tried to write the final chapter for his life by putting him on a cross. But Jesus rewrote that chapter and came back to life. The devil thought he had Jesus. They'd already printed the headline, Jesus is dead. They had already sent out the presses. They'd already sent out the email. They meant Jesus is dead. They'd already given the permission for Sunday's paper to read Jesus is dead and gone. But Jesus rewrote the final chapter. Jesus got up early that Sunday morning, and the devil was forced to print a retraction. And beloved, Jesus is telling the church, and he's telling you and I, that the devil may write some of the chapters or may have influence on some of the chapters, but in the end, he's going to have the last say. So staying faithful is, is, is knowing who Jesus is. And so, so that's important for you to get into the Word. That's important for you to come to Bible study. That's important for you to study on your own. That's important for you to get up with Jesus on your mind and, and let Jesus stay on your mind all day and then go to sleep with Jesus on your mind. It, it, it's important for you to know who he is, amen, to know his majesty, his strength, his power, and his grace, to know that there's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing impossible with God. You've got to know who Jesus is because when you know who he is, you can hang in there. So not only staying faithful knowing who Jesus is, write that down, and staying faithful is about knowing what God sees as valuable and important. Hmm. So it's not only knowing who Jesus is, but it's knowing what God sees is important and valuable. Because you know some stuff God sees ain't important. Some stuff we do is not that valuable. Let's take a look at the text. Jesus tells the church that he knows they are poor. Hmm. He knows about their trouble. He knows their poverty, and he knows about their persecution and affliction. He knows. Now, I get excited about that because he knows. That, that we, we, we can jump on that just, just by the fact that he knows. That's a shout for another Sunday. But, but let's take a look. He said he tells them that in the kingdom of God, even though you are poor physically, you're rich. Hmm. In the world's eyes, they're poor and maybe even weak. But in God's eyes they're rich. Jesus lets them know that in the economy of the kingdom, they're really shot callers and big ballers. Oh, you're not, oh y'all, y'all didn't shout like you should have shouted. Amen. In God's economy, the eternal economy, the economy that's going to be here when all this is said and done, in, in God's economies, you big ballers. They're rich in God's eyes. Uh, they, they have nothing in man's eyes, but in God's eyes, they have riches. And beloved, many times we will not have what the world calls success or power, but in God's eyes, we are rich. Uh, see, the wealth that is obtained in this world will fade away, but the wealth obtained in God's kingdom is eternal. That's why Jesus said, said in Matthew 6, you got a store of treasures in heaven because that, look, because moth can't make it go away, rust can't make it fade away, and thieves can't steal it. But everything on here is something to get stolen or rot or get destroyed. But there's some treasures that you can store up on in heaven that can never be taken away. And beloved, you got to understand, there's some stuff that is not going to make you rich really, but there's some stuff that's going to make you really rich eternally with God. Amen. You got to understand wealth in the kingdom of God is eternal. He says to them, he said, I know you don't, I know you're, you're being uh, cut off right now. I know you're being disenfranchised right now. I know folk won't, won't give you a job right now. Folk won't buy your goods, amen. Folk who used to support you don't support you anymore. I know you, you're broken down, but when I understand in God's economy, you're doing the right thing. In God's economy, amen, you're rich. In God's economy, you're storing up treasures in heaven. You're going to, I know you're going through, son, but I need you to understand, God doesn't look at the, work, the things that the world sees are valuable. God looks at stuff that is totally different, amen. The stuff that God sees as valuable is, can you, can you walk right before the Lord? Can you talk right before the Lord? Can you live right? Can you shine your light before men and let all the world to see? Can you speak like Christ? 
Christ, talk to people like Christ, handle folk like Christ. When God sees that, amen, he sees you, amen, as if you are covered in gold. He sees you as if you're tripping with diamonds. Y'all not here. Look, you can have on diamonds, but just be mean and nasty. You can drive a nice car, but nobody really want to ride with you. But when you got the characteristics of Jesus Christ, amen, oh man, you, you, you're the most lovable person, the kindest person, the gentlest person, amen. That's what God is looking for. And he said, they may see you as poor, but I see your faithfulness as valuable. That's why the hope of the believer is when all is said and done for us to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. We got to know what's valuable to God because a whole lot of stuff that the world sees, the way the world operates, is not how God operates. And we got to know what God sees as valuable. See, Stan, let me help you. Because there are going to be some times where you're trying to be faithful to God and there are going to be folk around you saying, man, you ought to get that up. But you got to ask yourself, how does God see what I'm doing? One preacher said one time, he said, I only got one constituent. I said, what does that mean? He said, I ain't got one person I got to please. There's only one person I'm trying to hear well done when all is said and done. There's only one person that wakes me up in the morning and starts me on our way. There's only one person that gave me a reasonable portion of help. There's only one person that wipes my tears in the midnight hour. There's only one person that brought me through trials and tribulations. That's who I got to give glory. Staying faithful is about knowing who Jesus is. Well, staying faithful is also about knowing what's valuable and important to God. Uh, not only is that so, so and now we want to see uh, that, that staying faithful is also about, watch this, not walking in fear and knowing God is in control. I'm almost done. Jesus continued to tell them that, 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 that they're suffering, but more trouble's coming. Well, I don't know, but that's not, well, I didn't really see that as good news, but that's how he says good. He said, but they should hold on, stay faithful, because he was going to see them through. He even says, stay faithful even up to death. He tells them, you may have to go to prison for 10 days. Uh, this, this is just a test, he tells them. See, they had to be able to endure even till death because their ability to suffer for the cause of Christ would be a testimony of their faith to anybody who saw them. Okay, what are you saying, Pastor? Some folk have to see your faithfulness under pressure for their faith to get strong. Okay, hold on your pen. What are you saying, Pastor? Some folk got to see you go through and through some more so they can see that God is real. Because they're going to say, hold on, I would have given up on day one and now on day ten. What kind of faith do you have? That can, what, what kind of God do you serve that can give you that kind of strength under this kind of pressure? What kind of God can hold you like that? What, I need that God in my life. Ah, people must see that we have a faith that can endure hardship and trials. People have to see that we have a faith that will hold on to God, knowing that God is going to make a way somehow, in some way. Uh, people must see that you haven't quit on God. As I, and as I close, I, I, I was thinking about all of this, and I was finishing up my sermon, and, and I was saying, I said, Lord, why you, why you tell them 10 days? Because most scholars agree that the 10 days was really just, the, you know, it was just a, a number, because they were, some of them going to spend longer than 10 days. And, and I said, Lord, what, what's the 10 days? So I, I did the best thing that you can do now in 2022, is I put myrrh and 10 days in my Google search. And as I was scrolling down, I wasn't really seeing anything. And, and then I stumbled on this, this, this medicinal website, this, this website that does natural remedies and natural medicines. And, uh, and it said, I saw eight to 10 days in the search. And so I 
click on it, uh, Minister Green, and, and it talked about soaking myrrh for eight to ten days. And when you soaked it in alcohol for eight to ten days, now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be soaked in alcohol, amen. Alcohol, amen, is a trying agent. Alcohol stings, and alcohol hurts, and uh, alcohol purifies. But if it's if you soaked it in there for eight to ten days, and then medicine would be released from the myrrh. Hey, y'all not hear what I'm saying. It took eight to ten days for something on the inside of the myrrh to come on to the outside that could bless somebody, that could heal somebody, that could change somebody's life. And beloved, I'm here to let you know that God might let you go through something for an extended period of time. He may have to submerge you and soak you in that trial, in that suffering, but it's because he's trying to get something out of you that's going to bless somebody, that's going to heal somebody, that's going to be medicine for their soul. And that's why you got to stay faithful and not be in fear because if God's going to send you through it, God's going to get you out of it. But while you're in it, he's working something out in your life that's going to make you a blessing. Ah, stay faithful. Stand to your feet. That's all I got. That, I don't know about you, that helps me. The Lord said, you, you, I'm submerged right now. But he's just trying to get something out of me. And it takes eight to ten days. Woo. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father needs it. Musicians start to play. Lord, this is one of the two churches that you sent an encouraging word to. For some of the churches, it was a word of correction. This church just needed a word of encouragement. There's somebody here today, they didn't need to hear a corrective word at all today. They just needed to be encouraged. And for that soul, maybe just one person, I'm praying that God will help you stay faithful to whatever he's called you to do. For whatever he's put in your heart, stay faithful to God. Don't give up. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Stay faithful. He's working on you. He's in control. Remember who Jesus is. And remember what God sees as important. Now, Lord, there may be someone on the sound of my voice who does not know you as Savior and Lord. We don't want to leave this day without saying God is the best thing that could ever happen to them. If they put Jesus in their life and let Christ come in their life, he'll save their soul and turn their life around. So, Lord, while I'm praying, I'm asking you, Lord, you to move on someone's heart, whether they're watching on the Internet or in person. Speak to their spirit and speak to their soul. And let them know now is the time for you to make a decision. For some, it'll be receiving Christ for the very first time. For others, it'll be making a commitment to join our church. But Lord, speak to their hearts right now in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said amen. As the choir sings, I'll ask our deacons and ministers to get in position. Ministers, go to the phones in case someone is calling. 804-232-5124. 804-232-5124. If you're ready to make a decision, it's time for you to come. If you're under the sound of my voice and and you don't know the Lord has just saved you, but you want to know, come now. If you need a church home, come now. Maybe you're struggling and you need one of these deacon or deaconesses to pray for you. Come down and grab them. Just let them know what your decision is. You need prayer? If you need Christ, you need to join, just let them know. Is there one? Come. you know, 
you don't have to walk down an aisle to get saved. Because sometimes walking down an aisle it makes folks a little nervous. That's all right. Right where you are, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, speak to God and say, God, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he came so that I might have life and save my soul. I believe he died and was resurrected on the third day. And Lord, I, I want Jesus to come into my life. It's a real simple request. It's the kind of request God does not deny. If you want Christ in your life, all you have to do is say, Lord, come into my life. The reality is he's knocking at the door of your heart, wanting to come in. If you ask him to come in, your next step is to get connected. If you're hearing the sound of my voice and you pray that kind of prayer, when the service is over, grab any one of these deacons or grab me and say, Pastor, I, I prayed that prayer. I'm ready to join. And then we'll get you connected to your new members' classes. If you're, you can join our church at any time. Amen. Because you can join God's church at any time. So I don't want you to think you had to walk down the aisle to get saved. You can get saved right where you are. But your next step is to get connected to a church where you can grow in your faith because God doesn't want you just saved. He wants you saved and strong, saved and growing. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Do we have any for right hand today? Do we have right hand today? Okay, let's make sure. I don't see. Okay. So we're going to go right into our communion celebration. Hopefully, you received, if you're taking communion, your communion packet on the way in. If you don't have a communion packet and you wanted to take communion, just raise your hand. We will make sure you get one. Our sister right there needs one. Amen. Just keep your hand up. And our sister right there, and our sister right there. Just keep them up. Right here, it's Angie to your left. Right there, amen. And then right up, Calvin, Sister Hale, I think it's right there. That's Sister Hale, right? Yeah, that's Sister Hale. Amen. So have your communion pack. And it's our custom before we do communion, we read our church covenant. And say, so, Pastor, why do we do that? Well, when we did communion, communion is about us recommitting ourselves to Christ, but also recommitting ourselves to one another. And there's several things in the covenant that we need to constantly be mindful of so that when we come before the Lord's table, we are right and ready. Amen. So I'm going to ask that our media team will put our church covenant up on the screen in preparation for our communion, and we can all stand to read it together. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in the presence of God, angels in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter the covenant with one another. As one body in Christ, we engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its worship, prosperity, and spirituality, to sustain its ordinances, disciplines, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger, to abstain from the illegal sale and excessive use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage, seek God's help in abstaining from all practices, which bring unwarranted harm to the body or jeopardize our own or others' faith, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in speech, 
to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure without delay. We moreover engage that we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. And now unto him who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, be power and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now, I would encourage you as a member of Second Baptist to memorize the church covenant. Because that's something you want to always keep before you. Praise God. The strong words in there. Our mission, our responsibilities, amen, our call to action, our love for one another. And so we come to the communion table. We remember our relationship with God. Jesus said to his disciples, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. The most powerful words he wanted them to remember not only his words, but his life, his death, and subsequently his resurrection. We come in the same vein to remember his life, his death, and his resurrection, and to be mindful that we are to live for Christ, live through Christ, and allow everything we say and do be for Christ. So we want to have our hearts ready and right before God. So let us pray a prayer of preparation to partake of these elements. Who's praying that? Who? Is it me? Okay. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, seeking you, asking you to forgive us and cleanse us and renew us. Forgive us for any action done, a word spoken, or thought that we had that was not of you. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you cleanse us right now anew and afresh. And Lord, we recommit ourselves to you. We recommit ourselves to one another. If we need to ask for forgiveness, if we need to reconcile, let us quick to do that on today and not waste any time. Lord, for we need right relationships with you and right relationships with one another. Now, Lord, bless the elements and bless our hearts as we partake in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen. Let us eat and drink together. Let the church say amen. amen. Let us look to the Lord for the benediction as we prepare to go forward. Remember the word today. Stay faithful. Stay faithful to God and all that God has entrusted in your care. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, guide us, direct us, strengthen us for your work in this world. And Lord, let us understand, Lord, that what you see as valuable is not always what the world sees as valuable. Help us to remember who you are in every situation. And let us know that you have everything under control. And we should not walk in fear. In Jesus' name. And all the people of God said amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Go in peace.